whether it was merited or not, I, I will never know, but I definitely put in the, you know, the work to make the show special and I had a lot of fun with it. And then from there, um, I, I sung a song in that show called uh, Air Mail Special. Basically, I had never sung jazz in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then when I got asked to do this festival, I remember saying to my mom, I should probably learn some jazz. Awesome. Um, so yeah, this is about you and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. Cool. Um, awesome. So first off, talk to me. Uh, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Montreal in Canada. And okay. uh, yeah, I now live, I uh, just moved actually at the beginning of the year to Miami. So uh, up until this year, I was still living in Montreal my whole life. Oh, wow. now you're in Miami, huh? Yeah. Wow, that must be a different uh, weather change there yeah, quite This a bit. time of year, I'm really <laughs> feeling the difference. Got to, got to oh, say. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it gets so freezing in Montreal, right? Like you negative, are. like a million. Yes. It feels like you're in just the like Antarctica or something. It's really something. <laughs> oh, man. And now you're in like, it, it's what is it? I'm in Nashville. So I'm sure it's got to be quite. Is it sunny right now yeah. in Florida? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful out. It's a really nice day. That's awesome. Um, cool. Well, so born in Montreal, what was it like growing up there? I mean, this sounds like you just moved to Miami and spent what the rest of your life up there. Yeah, well, you know, growing up there, it was really nice. It was like a beautiful place to be. There's a lot going on. And I think that um, like living there is what really set me on the path that I'm on now for music, because uh -huh. we are home to one of the biggest jazz festivals in the world, the Montreal Jazz Festival. And that was kind of how I got my start in music. Um, so growing up there, I, I, I was 12 years old when I started performing. So, wow. so it was kind of like that city was my playground in a way, you know, I did a lot of shows around my hometown. I started out doing a lot of charity shows actually like around Montreal. Um, mm -hmm. when I was 11, 10 or 11, I was just itching to perform, to get on stage. And, um, when I turned about, uh, I was actually, it was, I was, I was 11. I did a couple shows and in one of the audiences was the founder of the Montreal Jazz Festival who what, happened just to happened be, to be there yeah, just out of nowhere. Just wow. like that. And he heard me sing. I sang uh, two Aretha Franklin songs actually. <laughs> and, uh, and he asked if I would open up the whole festival. So that was like the craziest opportunity. And of course I said, yes. And, and you're 11. I was 11. Then the summer rolls around by the summer. I was 12 because my birthday is okay. in February. <laughs> so yeah, so I opened up the festival outside uh, right before the Neville Brothers. And this was in front of around like, I'd say 80 to 100,000 people because it was the opening night. It was beautiful outside and it was outside. So the entire downtown was filled for the Neville Brothers. So I came on stage um, totally, I guess, unaware of just the magnitude of the, the crowd and everything. Mm -hmm. And I just had a blast. And, and I did two shows in one night. I opened and closed. And um, it was just wow, they really great. put everything on you. I mean, that's insane to open <laughs> yeah. and then close. Like, uh, and he just sees you performing one time at this spot he ended up rolling it into. Was, like, looking back on it, it's definitely, it feels divine in a way because it was just too, too strange a coincidence, you know, for, and for also a lot of trust in a kid. Right. So, that's what I was also thinking. Like, not only is he going to let you sing in front of 100,000 people open up the thing and then close it out as well. Like we'll yeah. talk about like some confidence in you. Absolutely. Um, whether it was merited or not, I, I will never know, but I definitely put in the, you know, the work to make the show special and I had a lot of fun with it. And then from there, um, the, I, I sung a song in that show called uh, Airmail Special. Basically I had never sung jazz in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then when I got asked to do this festival, I remember saying to my mom, I should probably learn some jazz. Cause all I had ever listened to was really like Motown soul, like a lot of classic R and B. And, um, my mom's like, yeah, that's a good idea. If you want to check out what jazz is, you know? So I, I went to the computer. We had one computer in my house, one like central computer in the kitchen at the time. This was in 2006. Mm -hmm. And I typed in jazz in iTunes. And the first name that popped up was Ella Fitzgerald. So oh, I wow. worked race and just was mesmerized, fell in love. And that was that I, I just became completely obsessed. <laughs> That's amazing. So bef before that, like, I mean, to sing that well at 11, like, do you come from a musical household at all? Or like, how did you even get involved? Um, I came from my, my dad plays piano. My mom, uh, she has, I say she's like, a, she sings well, but she only sings for me. She's a very shy singer, but she has a nice voice. 
Okay. Um, but I don't know. I don't think like I definitely come from a house that encouraged music, you know, like it was always around, but nobody in my family did it like I guess at this the the way that I could at that age, you know. So mm-hmm. but I had the support and um it was it was great. And also I think I was exposed to really good music early on. Like I was listening to a lot of just what my parents liked. I liked like old stuff, not really so much contemporary music. Sure. And was there like a moment that, I mean, obviously you enjoy performing or even had at a a very early age at 11 to be doing that. Um, Was there, do you remember like, was there something that you were doing that your parents were like, oh, we should put her in vocal lessons or like, how do you even get to that point? uh, Well, kind of that early on. Yeah, well, it started out because my dad, because he plays piano, he has like a little like dad band, you know, with like a bunch of his friends. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So they would play in my basement um, and I would go downstairs and be like, can I sing a song with you? <laughs> and, and they were like gearing up to do this charity show that year. And um, I said, can I come on stage with you guys? I'd love to sing a song with you. And they said, sure. And that's sort of how it began. <laughs> and then you sang and your dad was like, whoa, OK, she's got some real skill. I think so. I, my dad claims he could tell that I had something even when I was like two years old because I would clap on beat and stuff, you know, like I, at, at a very young age. But who knows if that's true or not? It could just wow. be like your dad. <laughs> and then do you go into like, uh, are you in voice lessons or like what's kind of the how do you get um, discovered on this stage at 11? Like, how do you get it was that? really natural? Honestly, yeah. it was very it was just a very natural sort of the stars align type of situation. It was it just I don't think I could ever recreate it. It just happened. Okay. The way it did. And I wasn't a voice lessons. Um, I had a vocal coach to to help me get ready for that show. Um, but she, it wasn't really like theory. It wasn't like vocal theory. It was more just like teaching me how to emote and teaching me how to get into a song and let go. And she was really great. Her name was Nancy Martinez. And right. then after that, when I got really into jazz, I wanted to find a, a vocal coach who had a background in jazz to help me understand, you know, chord progressions and how to um, like what swing is and all that stuff. So then I, I got at 14 years old, I started working with, she's still my vocal coach today. Her name is Sharda Banman and she's been with me for like my whole life. She's great. Wow. And do you go to, did you go to like a art school or something? Or I mean, no, I went to to reg- you were going to regular high school, but you were doing all these big things. Yeah. So after the jazz fest, I got discovered by um, Phil Ramone, who produced, you know, he's one of the most legendary producers. He's worked with everyone from like um, like Billy Joel, he did The Stranger, he did Paul Simon's yeah. albums, you know, I don't know, the list goes on and on. He's just uh-huh. incredible. Um, and he heard me singing Airmail Special, that four minute scat song I learned for the jazz festival. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to produce my first ever like full length studio album. So my first record was produced by Phil. And that wow. went, that did really well in, in, um, in Canada and in the States too. And then from there, I, I was heard by Quincy Jones who then kind of took me under his wing because I was singing all his arrangements and stuff, you know, as a, as a kid, I was really, a, I'm a huge Quincy Jones fan, not only for his Michael Jackson stuff, but really like his Frank Sinatra stuff, his Ella Fitzgerald stuff, Sarah Yeah, Vaughan. people forget that he's written so yeah. many other songs than- He's Michael. produced like <laughs> Sinatra and the Sands. It's like one of the most yeah. popular Frank Sinatra albums ever. But it's <laughs> just like already like, oh, Michael Jackson, yeah. like right away. Totally. No, he's, he is like- next level genius once in a lifetime once in a I think I don't think there'll ever be another Quincy Jones like he's just incredible mm-hmm. um and so he, he produced that first record uh Phil produced and, the first one yeah oh Phil produced the first one and then from that album that's how you met Quincy Jones yeah pretty much okay. um, I met Quincy around the time I was recording that first one with Phil and then my second album Little Secret uh Quincy uh-huh. exec produced that one so he was very involved after that and in my management too. And he really just took me under his wing and um, he's, he's been really great and incredible. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. So was it going into the studio to record that first album? What was that like? Was, were you nervous or just, you already knew you kind of had it? I, I wasn't ever nervous um, because it was just so exciting and so new looking back on it. I think as an adult, I understand what was at stake. But I think Uh being so young, it really worked to my advantage of just not really having that awareness yet. And to Uh me, it was just like a good time and it was exciting. And I got to, you know, I I fell in love with the studio immediately. It is still my absolute favorite part of my job. I love being in the studio. We call ourselves studio rats. (laughs) Like Uh I can just stay in the studio for hours and hours and hours and completely lose track of time. It's my favorite place. So um, yeah, I fell in love with it probably also because it was such a great experience, my working with Phil. And it really set me up to understand like 
how things work there, working with one of the greatest to ever do it. Um, I really, le- I just learned a lot. I was trying to take in as much as I possibly could from him. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the first, are you talking about the, your, the self-titled record, the, the record Nikki? Yeah. Did you release something before that, right? A couple of years earlier? I released a live album called Ella of the Ice Swing. That was from uh-huh. my jazz fest. So when I did the Montreal Jazz Fest, they invited me back the year after. And we really did it up uh, much bigger. And it was like much more polished that year because I was a little bit older and I was really into jazz. So I did a whole show dedicated to Ella Fitzgerald where I just sang all her arrangements. Okay. Um, and that's also where I discovered Quincy Jones because a lot of those arrangements were his. And mm-hmm. I also did one song that he did called Relax Max for Dinah Washington, which is a really great arrangement. And I did his arrangement of that. So, yeah. Wow. And I mean, to be for that first record to come out and do as well as it did, like, what was, what was that like? I mean, being, you know, kind of, you've, you've had these big successes, like really early. I mean, that, having that validation from 11, you know, being like, yeah. oh, you can come sing in front of this jazz. Fest. And then your, your, your album comes out and you're nominated for Juno Awards and it's selling platinum records. Like that must have been just, can you, was it just moving so fast or were you able to like take it in a bit or? It was really moving fast. I mean, it was, it felt it's funny because when you're a kid, every year feels so much longer, right? Because you have so much growth in a year. Like you're so different from 12 to 14 years old. Like, oh, especially in those early years, right? I mean, exactly. think about where you were in middle school to a senior year in high school is only yeah. four or five years. But you feel so different, right? You're like a complete, huh. you go from a kid to just like a teenager. <laughs> sure. And I did that all sort of in the public eye. So it felt, it's weird. It felt like it was moving fast and slow. It was, it was really quick and fast paced. I was always traveling. I was constantly on the road. Um, touring. I, I was barely ever really even in school. And mm-hmm. um, like that element of it was very just fast. But then when I look back on it, it feels like so much happened in such a short time. Um, and it made it feel slower just because of the amount of things that were kind of coming in, you know, so mm-hmm. the opportunities were definitely there, but they were always met with like hard work. And so I think that sort of slowed things down and allowed me to sort of take a step back. Um, Mm -hmm. but it was just a blur really. Like now that I look back on it, I always say like, I'm only 28, but it feels like I've lived like 10 lives. (laughs) I was going to say you've done more than most, right? (laughs) I just feel like I've had two, like really two distinct chapters, you know, like it's like my, my, my childhood was marked publicly. So I can go back and reference a lot of things that I did and know exactly where I was at in my life at that time, which is really nice, actually. That is cool. Um, but you were still attending just a regular public school. I, yeah, I was, I was just attending regular school, but it was a smaller school and they were very uh, supportive with like the fact that I would travel and they had also a program there called like the sports program because they had some athletes in our school that were like training to be professional skiers and stuff so they would give them just like the minimum amount I guess of like the course load um, in order to pass and to graduate properly. And I, they sort of adapted that for me and I supported the fact that I was missing so much of it they were great. That's cool. What about your friends? Were they stoked for you or were there like haters at your school? I was bullied a lot. I didn't have it very easy in high school. I had like a couple good friends. Um, but for the most part, I think there's like the flip side of what I was able to accomplish and go through is that it was very alienating and mm-hmm. very lonely at times, especially traveling and being around people just like three times my age for most of my childhood was, um, at, you know, it definitely like I I look back on that and I'm just like yeah I probably should have been around kids my own age a bit more but the opportunities were really fun and I was having a good time with it so you know right I I mean I would imagine just kids being jealous and that's could be part of the bullying and I think there was there was definitely that I think it was yeah probably that I just just the amount of like I guess just the attention but I never spoke about anything in school like I made it very I was very deliberate about that because yeah. I was aware how kids can be. Mm-hmm. And um, I just never brought up anything I was doing outside of school when I was in school. I would just completely keep my mouth shut and just go to class. <laughs> That's awful, though. I'm sure that was hard to do. Like, you can't even, like, share your experiences with people. Yeah. And it, like I said, it could it felt alienating definitely at times. But it's almost like I didn't really want to talk about it because I knew that it would make people think of me differently. And I didn't want that. I was just, oh, sure. I, I w- it's not that I didn't talk. I just didn't talk about my music, you know? Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you said you, you kind of felt like isolated or alienated because I've heard like, uh, like comedians talk about that. Like they'll be on the road and do like four nights in a city because that's usually, or two shows and four nights in or whatever. 
And all they do is they'll go back to their hotel and just hang out and watch TV. And people just yeah. think they're like out partying. And, and it's like, no, yeah. it's a really like lonely. Touring uh, can be like that. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would think that. Because I mean, you're just going city to city and you don't probably have time to no. do much more than sound check, do the show, get on the bus or get on in the yeah. car or whatever and, and travel to the next town. Exactly it. Everyone's like, oh, you should check out this when you're in this city. I'm like, I will not. I just don't have time. There's no <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. way. <laughs> You're like, I'm there from two to 11 and then we're headed on to the next place. Totally. Wow. Um, well, I want to talk to you. I mean, we'll talk about your, your stuff coming out and, and your, your, obviously the, your later career, but I'm curious about the um, Olympic broadcasts and with, I believe and how big that song is and um, having that moment, like, tell me about that song and uh, doing that. Yeah. Well, that song again, things just sort of lined up in a very like, I don't know, it felt serendipitous because that song was actually written for Celine Dion. They wanted her to sing the Olympic theme song in in Canada. That was the idea. Really? Yeah. And it was at the time in her career where she was taking a little hiatus because she wanted to focus on her family. Uh -huh. And so she just declined it. And then I, um, the guy who wrote the song, Stefan Macchio, he heard me singing at the, um, I think it was like a Montreal Canadiens game. I was singing like the national anthem. <laughs> that's crazy still too. And he, like, yeah and he you heard, know, just at the canadians game no big deal because <laughs> well that isn't like the, in montreal the, the, i don't know it's a smaller it's it's a city but it feels kind of like a small town vibe where everybody kind of knows everyone so once right. i did the jazz fest they sort of asked me to do things like that so i sung at the uh i sung at the game and he heard me there and he heard my tone and he said he thought that it would be perfect for this song mm -hmm. so he asked if i would do it and then i didn't i had no idea how big that song was going to get but it was like the longest running number one i was the youngest person to ever have a number one song in Canada that was on the charts that long so that was pretty cool. was yeah time, but it was on all the time to the point where like I got really tired of it because then I would go to school and people would just start singing it to me in the hallways and it would again make me feel really uncomfortable like I was just like but I of course it gave, also gave me the opportunity to release my album and to you know have a world stage and I'll never ever take that for granted because it really like kind of catapulted my career into the next level so that was oh great. yeah because you went from what the canadian more of like just your country to then you can you hear me yeah i could hear you um there it goes it's, this has been a nightmare i'm um, sorry <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> apparently i needed a new uh mic cable here before my next interview um <laughs> i forgot what i was saying oh yeah i was gonna say you it went from just being what, like the Canadian Olympics, right? And then you, you got to sing in the, the winter, that big winter Olympics. Yeah, the winter, uh, well, it was for the winter Olympics, but the song was only in the, on a Canadian broadcast. Okay. So, so every but time still, we I mean, metal, that's huge. they played it. Every time we had anything, they were playing it. It was like all the time. I was like, oh my God, I can't escape this thing. But anyway, again, like, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. It was, a, of course, it was an amazing opportunity. And the Olympics was the the most incredible experience and it was so exciting to be part of that and to go to Vancouver and sing at the opening ceremonies I got to sing the national anthem for the Olympic Games for our country which was like the biggest honor and then oh I also sang gosh. at the opening ceremonies that was very scary that was right before my actually like two days after my 16th birthday and um I had to sing in front of 3.2 billion people that's what the broadcast number was <laughs> that was really scary oh yeah. wow <laughs> Yeah. Is it just like, a, are you even thinking about that? Or do they even tell you like, there's going to be billions I knew. watching. <laughs> I knew, I knew. Oh my gosh. I was terrified. I was like shaking before, but I think that, you know, nervousness and excitement feel like the same emotion. It just depends how you spin it. And I think mm -hmm. I was just trying to spin it like a positive thing, which it was, but of course I was terrified. I was more scared to fall because I was wearing high heels for like the very first time. And I had, oh. <laughs> to walk, had to walk downstairs to get to the center stage. And I was convinced I was going to trip. Um, and then I'm like, oh, I'm going to be a meme. What's going to like, I just knew oh, I, yeah, like, right? out what could happen. And I, thankfully I, I found my footing. I didn't fall. <laughs> was that the most nervous you've ever been at a performance? No, the most nervous I'd ever been for a performance was singing with Stevie Wonder. That was like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> that happened, um, that happened for Quincy Jones's 80th birthday. He, he had a big celebration with Michael Caine in, cause they have the same birthday in oh, Las wow. Vegas and they were doing a fundraiser and um, yeah, I got to sing with Stevie. That was just terrifying. I think it was in 2015, 14 or 15. Um, okay. 
and yeah sound checking with him that day feels like it's just crystallized in my memory forever I remember every detail of the day like it was one of those you know um, yeah how special is that oh my gosh it was it was incredible one of the best op, like the best experiences not only in my career but definitely in my life because I'm the biggest Stevie Wonder fan and just sharing a like just sharing a stage with him being next to him and feeling his presence and and just knowing like what he meant to me in my life and my journey as a musician um was really ex- just so overwhelming and I just kept thinking overjoyed overjoyed which of course is the song and he just got out on stage for sound check with his harmonica which was like a lot like bigger than I thought it would be I was just expe- expecting like a normal harmonica but it was like really like the size of like a like probably even bigger than that oh but wow I, he was um he started playing overjoyed on the harmonica right next to me and I was doing everything I possibly could not to cry or just like turn into a puddle on the stage because I just felt I felt so overjoyed myself you know yeah especially to be around your favorite artists like that and then have that moment I'm even if you could just have that moment and not do this to perform with him that must that would have just been I'm sure enough yeah like to, to watch that absolutely. I mean I'm just thinking about absolutely. that you know and then For not sure. only that then you get to one up it by performing did you meet him like prior or was it the first time you had no, ever the first met him? time I met him was on stage and I was also in charge of of like leading him to the piano um oh. like for the actual performance we walked out together and then he we we sang let the good times roll oh wow Quincy Jones arrangement of course for Quincy and um at one point like the thing with Stevie is that he's so off the cuff like he's so he's such a pro and he's so great at what he does that you never he'll never do the same thing twice so we practiced it in rehearsals and it went really well. And then in the show, he sung it completely different. And it was amazing. <laughs> of course, <laughs> it was amazing. But we were really feeding off each other. Like it was really like an, it felt improvised in a lot of ways. And at one point he does his part. And then as he's finishing his part, he goes, sing it, Nikki. <laughs> and I was like, he said my name. So like half my brain was freak, like fangirling. Out. Oh, yeah. It was like, be professional. You're here for a reason. You have to do your job. You know. <laughs> wow. And that's a cool thing. And they're really amazing thing about jazz is very um by like you kind of have to vibe off the person sure. and it it's can just kind of go yeah and it kind of happens in this organic way where it's not okay i know i'm going to do this 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 and this and then the song's going to be over it's like it could just go totally different than you expected absolutely oh my yeah. gosh and to be doing that on a stage with stevie wonder to be able to adapt like that it that's crazy it was wild he he's He's the best. I've gotten to hang with him a few times after that. And he's really such an amazing person too. Like mm-hmm. they, they say, don't meet your heroes. But I, I every time I have met one of mine, they're, they always live up to what I expect them to be. And I don't think that's a coincidence because Quincy always tells me you can never be more, your music can never be more or less than you are as a person. And mm-hmm. I think that when you're at the top of your craft, like Stevie Wonder or like Herbie Hancock or some people that I've had the opportunity to work with, like it's just it's they are a direct reflection of the work they put out into the world and it's just a beautiful thing to be able to meet somebody that you respect that much and have them be so cool and down to earth yeah yeah wow well with the the next record you put out little secret was it was going into that album was were you worried about kind of keeping up that level of um you know people like that selling that many records or like even having that level of success off of that album at all or was it just going to the next album like no whatever. there was definitely an, more of an awareness of the commercial aspect of it and I think looking back in hindsight I'm really proud of that record um uh-huh. and I had to I had to explore writing my own songs and you know getting into that area of things but my whole goal and I was a kid of course you know I was like 16 17 years old when I was working on that album but when I when I was recording it, I my goal really was to write pop songs that had a jazz element to it because I wanted to bring jazz to a younger generation. Uh-huh. Um, but now that I'm older and I look at that, I feel like maybe the way my, the analogy I use is like I had one foot in the jazz world, one foot in the pop world, and then I just sort of ended up in like a split instead of just being like more centered and picking something that I feel was more like down the line of what I wanted to get out of my music. And that's what this uh-huh. last record is, is like, I just went back to my roots completely. My my latest record, Nikki by Starlight. Yeah. Um, and it's just like full on jazz. So it's really cool for me to be able to look back at my discography and like see the progression. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm like the most proud I've ever been of my last album. And, and like, I, I feel that it's really 
what I was always supposed to be doing, but I couldn't have gotten here without having experimented like I did to get here. So I, sure. I'm really proud of everything I've done, but this last record specifically definitely feels like a homecoming. Okay. With a uh, little secret was you said that you were writing those songs. Is that the first time you had written for yourself? Yeah. Well, I did. What some was that writing. like? I did some co-writing on my very first album. Okay. Um, and then the, yeah, little secret. I did co-writing again and some writing myself. That was, that was so much fun because actually um, my one, my mentor besides Quincy, he was one of my best, best friends and mentor. Um, he passed away in two, 2016, but his name is Rod Temperton. Oh and gosh. Rod Temperton wrote uh, Thriller, Off the Wall, Rock With You, like all of Michael Jackson's greatest hits. He wrote um, Groove Line, Boogie Nights. He was in Heat Wave. So he wrote like some of the He's oh, just wow. yeah, he's yeah, the yeah. most successful songwriter of all time. In, <laughs> sure. my opinion, in my opinion, the best. Like he's just, he was also just the best person ever. So I would speak to him like once a week. And he really just mentored me like crazy to help form me and 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 get me into songwriting um in a different way. And so I learned everything I know about writing from Rod a million percent. Mm -hmm. And so being able to apply that and record Little Secret, like I was, I was sending all my demos to Rod whenever I'd work on a new song and he would always help guide me and like, Oh, you should try this in this area. So on, on little secret, I wanted to give him an executive producer credit. Cause really he, he really helped like mold that album. Yeah. But in, in true rod fashion, he never did anything for credit ever. He was the most humble down to earth guy. And actually his nickname in the industry is the invisible man because he just did everything for the love of the music. He did not care for the glory. And, um, he just said, he, I said, I really want to give you an exec producer credit. And he said, it's fine. You don't have to do that. And so there's like a huge page on like the physical copy of my album that's dedicated to Rod. And I wrote a whole like, thank you to him. And I just said, this album wouldn't exist without him. Like he helped guide it in every way possible um, from like the instrumentation to the arrangements to everything. He was like so instrumental in the actual process of recording it. So writing songs to me feels like a connection to Rod even now, which is so nice because I get to apply everything that he taught me. And on my yeah. album, Turn Down the Sound, which came after Little Secret, yeah. Turn Down the Sound, and Rod and I wrote that together. So that's a co-write with Rod. And then he wrote a song on that album called Bubbles that he wrote completely for me. And mm -hmm. that was the last song he was working on before he passed away. So that's like something I will always keep. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Because you said he passed away in 2016. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then that record came out, what, in 2020? Uh, Turn Down the Sound. Yeah. Or is it yeah. before that? Okay. Uh, it was so, before that. I think, you know, it was 2020. Yeah. Okay. So you just had those songs. And I mean, I'm, that must have been so difficult when, yeah, when he passed really, away. Kind of way. Terrible. Yeah. So you just kind of held it until it was what uh, the right time to release a song. Yeah. I just wanted, I wanted to build something around it. And it felt like it belonged on that album mm -hmm. uh, more than, you know, anything that I had been working on before that. So it was like a really great fit. And sure. I wanted the album to be called, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to um, name the album after something that Rod had worked on. So the title track is the song that he and I did together, because it's kind of like a tribute. And actually my song Nerve on that album, I wrote uh -huh. that for him. I wrote that for Rod. Oh, also. wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And uh, was, I mean, to, to put that album out, was that during the middle of the pandemic or was yeah. it early on? Oh, okay. It was like really during, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't tour it, couldn't promote it really. It was like people hadn't really figured this out yet, you know, being able to go. Right. To that, you know? So it was just like put into the abyss and hope that it does something and that people hear it. But really that album was very cathartic to release because of the the connection that it held for me with Rod. Sure, sure, sure. Well, where were you at during the pandemic? Like, were you writing that album or like, how did, obviously it affected everybody, but in, as a musician and for your art, like did it, and not being able to tour it, but like, what were you working on going into you know the middle of March um I was working on this album right before the pandemic hit okay and then, um yeah I, I recorded that in 2018 2019 turned down the sound mm -hmm. I think I think that's right and then we released it like right in the summer of like the height of the pandemic and then or maybe it was right before it was before. I don't know what I'm talking about. It was before. It was recorded before the pandemic. And then I went to Japan because I was promoting it there and I did a couple shows there. And then the pandemic hit. And then my last album I recorded during the pandemic. That was like Okay, Nikki by Starlight was recorded during the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. That was really crazy. That was like in the height of it. I had to go into the studio with my mask and everything. And I never left my own booth. We made the booth like a control room because I also co-produced it. 
So okay. I had like my own screen and like everything sitting on, like I had basically my own little control room within the suit, the booth, which is normally they're two separate things, but we set it up so that I wouldn't have to leave the room. And so I would just go there and lock myself in this space and spend hours and hours and hours recording and then go home with my mask and everything. It was really fun. It was, it was crazy looking back on it, but really fun. <laughs> wow. Do you feel like there's anything? Was or real quick, was that the first record that you have co-produced yourself? Yes. Okay. And yeah. um looking back at the recording process and, and co-producing the album, was there something that or a moment that you can remember that maybe wouldn't have happened on the album, like a sound that you found or a lyric that you thought of? Like that was, you know, kind of it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't recorded in the way it was and the way the world was kind of I working think at that time. The pandemic, um, for creatively for me, it really did work in my favor. Of course, so much awful. Like I would never want the pandemic to happen, but it right. did. It got a look also for the silver lining. And for me, that silver lining was coming back to jazz because we were, we were locked basically in our homes, right, for the whole time. And um, I was just left to my own devices. And I was, I had just released Turn Down the Sound, um, uh -huh. a couple, you know, a few months before. And I was thinking, okay, well, what's my next move? Like, what do I want to do? Do I want to write now? Do I want to? What do I want to do? And I just kept listening to jazz in a way that I hadn't really before um, because we were just in our homes. It was cozy. I just kept putting on Miles Davis and listening to stuff. And I was like, wow, I really miss singing this stuff. Like I really miss it. And um, in the past, I sort of associated jazz to a lot of things that I was referring to at the beginning of this interview, like feeling alienated, feeling lonely, feeling kind of like a party trick. And um, cause I was like a little kid who could do all this, like, you know, crazy vocal stuff that was so much older than I was. Right. Uh -huh. but, um, as an adult and listening to this stuff on my own terms, I just felt like I reconnected to it in a deeper way. And I fell in love with what made me, I re-fell in love with what made me fall in love with music to begin with. So I was like, I need to do a full on jazz album. I've never done it before. Even my very first album was half jazz and half original songs. I've never done a full on standards album. Mm -hmm. So I started collecting on a playlist on Spotify, just like, you know, like 50 something songs that I always wanted to sing. And then from that list, I started narrowing it down. And this is from the Great American Songbook, right? Just like really old songs. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so from there, I was like, okay, narrowing it down to um, different feels, different tempos, and how I want to reimagine these songs. So my whole approach with this album was like, if I were alive while these songs were being written, um, how would I have interpreted them? Because that's what jazz was. Everybody would sing the same song, right? It's not like Flying to the Moon was Frank Sinatra's. There's a million versions of that song. His song right. was, rose to the top because it was like, the best one of the yeah the way he best. did it right so that's how jazz always was it was like everybody got to try it before um before it would become a hit and then whoever kind of had the hit it became their like flagship song mm -hmm. so i i wanted to approach it in the same way and that meant like recording it on all you know vintage microphones and yeah i saw that you recorded it on the same mic what that ella fitzgerald used yeah and frank alcis used that one too and then I also wanted to record it like um, all live takes. I was trying to get as just an authentic jazz experience. I feel like there's kind of a gap in the market for that where people are falling in love with music they're never gonna get to experience live when they uh -huh. listen to all these jazz songs. And I wanted to recreate that vintage jazz experience for a modern audience. Um, and I'm just really happy with the way that it came out. And I feel that the arrangements really represent a lot of music I would, listen to and also uh versions of these songs that hadn't really been done in this way before you know like mm -hmm. just different interpretations of these old songs i love that i love that and i, and I love that you that you said that you know people are listening to songs that maybe can't be recreated live because especially now with the amount of technology and programming you could do on a computer uh a lot of that can't you know unless it's just yeah. like a backing track or people trying to do it live it just it doesn't have the same feel and to record the whole thing live, there has to be something uh, when it comes to just like the feeling of the the way that you sang that one note that one time. I mean, I, I just I've heard other artists talk about recording like a demo track or a scratch vocal track and then using that on the album because it's like I couldn't recreate the same passion and the same, you know, energy that came behind it the first time. Totally. But that's what I that's what I love about the studio. And that's why I think I fell in love with it to begin with. The, the, the pressure is off when you're on stage performing live. You have to be a certain level. You have to be um, you have to get everything right. When you're in the studio, there's room for error because you're just exploring and you're playing and you're having fun. And and then you can, you know, take little elements from each 
take that you like and then you know or then approach a take like oh I like how I sung this in the first take I like how I sung this in the second take let's do a third take where I combine the two and I'll like get that you know as the Mm -hmm. one master um but on this record there's not one MIDI instrument everything is live but we had to record it in a super modern way normally I would go in a room with all my musicians like they did back in the day and Mm -hmm. record it live off the floor but because of COVID we couldn't be in the same room as each other so everybody had to be recording their parts separately which was like it sounds so vintage this album but it was recorded in a modern way even though it sounds vintage but then I released Christmas songs after the like yeah yeah yeah, I saw that and that was recorded all in one room because we could be you know (laughs) sure because it was later right I mean oh wow that's interesting so getting the vintage sound was done even in, in a way that you more modern way where the what the one person record the bass or the guitar or whatever and you'd have to kind of mix it all in exactly wow 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 that's cool that's um well since then i mean the christmas songs came out and uh now we're in 2023 which is unbelievable um what (laughs) what have what have you been working on or do you have i mean you just released that album last year so um what do you have or what have you been up to well i have some goals that i i would love to achieve um i I really don't feel I want to go back to writing original music eventually, but I want mm-hmm. it to be jazz. Like I want to write my own jazz songs. But now that I've reestablished myself as a real jazz standard singer, and that's really where I see my career going. I don't think I'll ever really go back to like the pop or R&B world. I just feel very at home and like a fish in water. I just feel like this is really what I'm meant to be doing. And it suits my voice the best. I have the most fun doing it. And it just feels very like right. So I don't want to mess with that. I want to keep doing that. And um, I, I just want to keep exploring. There's so many songs that I want to sing, old standards that I want to sing. And something I've, I really uh, think would be great eventually is a Christmas album. I only did two songs this year for Christmas. Yeah. It was really fun. And they performed even like just the numbers on Spotify and all that stuff. Like it was really high. It was the, it was the highest engagement I've ever had on, on something in that short amount of time so wow. I was like, okay, well I guess people like my voice in Christmas and I do too it's fun you know it's fun to sing those songs um even though I'm Jewish I could learn Christmas songs <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I keep joking I was like I should call the album like Merry Christmas from your favorite Jew you know? <laughs> no like, that would be good you should yeah, that would be should. funny um, I mean Barbara Streisand did a Christmas album you know so why yeah not? <laughs> why not exactly um that's funny I was gonna like never mind. <laughs> I was gonna say, do you what? Like, what's your fascination with Christmas? But you kind of said that your voice just works on the songs. I just love Christmas songs, and it's funny too. Like a lot of uh, my favorite Christmas songs, a lot of Christmas songs in general, written by Jewish people. Like my favorite Christmas song is um, uh, "Chestnuts Roasting on an Open." Oh uh, yeah. That was written by Mel Torme, who is Jewish, and he wrote it in July. So there you go. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I really kind of have a funny tie in with that. But anyway, I just think the music's good and it's fun. Like that's the short answer, really. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Nikki, thank you so much for for doing this and dealing with my technical issues. It and I'm gonna fine, by the way. Spend the hours trying to figure out. Yeah, I feel like it's got this crunchy, weird tone to it, but whatever. Okay. Uh that's just me being over it's analytical. Good. It's good. <laughs> <Yeah. Anyway. laughs> but um, I have one more question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Um, make sure that you are doing things for the right reasons. Um, don't chase fame. Don't, unless that's your reason. But in my experience, uh, I mean, this is again, a Quincy Jones quote, but he says, God walks out of the room when you're chasing a hit. And I really believe that you have to, you have to do something that you feel connected to first, and then people will connect with it. And that's been my experience. My last album, Nikki by Starlight was the most connected I've ever felt to something I've done. And it connected with people in a way that I didn't know it could. And I think that's the proof is in the pudding there. So just do do what you love and, and follow that. And then you can't really go wrong. Bring me the best word.